painting shadows in watercolour. That's what we're talking about in today's video. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find all things watercolour as well as drawing, mixed media, even a little bit of business and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the little bell icon, you get notified every time I have a new video for you. I make one free video a week here at least on YouTube on a Thursday with extra content for Patreon subscribers. So a few people have been asking me recently for help with mixing shadow colours and um, just generally for how to paint shadows in watercolour. It can be quite a tricky thing. It's one of those things where you almost have to keep your nerve if you're a bit too sort of a bit too wishy-washy, a bit too proddy about it, you know, sort of prod your work here and there. It tends not to look very good. I do have other videos on the subject of putting shadows into particular painting projects on this channel. However, today I want to talk really more generally about shadows, delve into what colours you need to use, the techniques for getting hard edges, soft edges and things in between, and also how to do specific types of shadow for specific types of subjects. So we're going to cover all that in this video. Now for full disclosure this video is um, here to launch a new paint set that I have available for you and this is a shadow colour set so I've pulled together um, with my years of knowledge of colour mixing and teaching I've pulled together some colours that I think will be most useful for um, helping you with muted and shadow colours within your paintings. However you do not need to have any interest in buying my paints in order to get value from this video. We're going to look at all sorts of techniques, all sorts of colours and on that subject let's start with the three types of colour that you can use to make shadows within your watercolour paintings. So in a moment I'm going to point the camera downwards and I'm going to show you three different types of colour that you can use for shadows. Now if you're thinking of something like a table, if for instance you had an orange table, then the colour would actually be a deeper shade of orange. So there's the idea of using a deeper shade of the colour of the object itself. However, that's not always possible. If you've got a light colour, something like yellow, you might need another option. And then there's a third option for things that are sort of multiple colours. So we're going to look at all of those now. I'm going to demonstrate with the paintbrush and point the camera downwards so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. So just before we start, let me tell you about the materials I'm using because somebody always asks. So I've got this size 10 brush here. This is Jackman's brush. Although it says sable on it, it's a synthetic brush and this is an early manufacturer's sample before we had the, uh, the proper names printed on the side. So this is an example of the sort of brush that you get in my Essentials brush set. Details in the video description. The paper I'm using today, this is a piece of SAA practice paper and later on I'll be moving on to this which is a Cotman watercolour block um, which I've got some samples ready made on. I'll be showing you how to paint specific shadows on specific things. Now this is not a brand or a type of paper indeed that I ever use normally but a friend of mine moved to France and he left behind this half used block for me. He left me a lot of his materials that he wouldn't be using anymore because he's uh, pretty much um, moved to digital work and this is a block so they're gummed around the edge. So there's that as well. I'm just using it up. I'm, I've come from a background of demonstrating to art societies and art clubs so I don't have this big sort of worry about paper. I will pretty much, for demonstration purposes anyway, I'll pretty much uh, paint on anything to be honest so there's that the paints I'm using I'll be using um, various colors I've got this little set here which is my Jackman's essential set but I'll also be showing you the new colors from my shadow set now this is what the paint sets look like when they come you get a tin and you've got tubes um, this is a previous set as one taken out because I've been using this a previous set this is the floral set and you get one of my color mixing leaflets in there as well so there'll be all of that in my new shadow set but at the moment I've just got um, a conglomeration of sort of um, odds and ends and manufacturer samples it's not because they're not ready to go out it's simply because they're in a different part of the country for me and I haven't been posted the final ones with the proper labels on yet so I'm going to be painting with those paints on this paper with this brush and so what we're going to do now is look at the different color options that you have so the first option you have is just to paint a color that is a darker shade of the surface that you're painting now this color here is called wet sand and I designed it for things like shadows on beaches and pathways so it's a fairly weak color this one it's not a staining color so let me show you what I mean. So if we paint some on like this and we'll make it fairly light. Okay, so if this were the color of the surface and then I had some shadow on top of it, I could simply go in with thicker paint and just make my shadows or my darker areas with the same color. So you might ask yourself, you know, why not always do this? 
because I've heard some instructors say that, you know, use this color for shadows or this color for shadows, but the truth is a shadow is always a darker shade of the surface it's on. However, there are times when this doesn't work very well. And the reason for that might be because you're using perhaps a red or a yellow, particularly with yellows, it can just be hard to get them dark enough. So let's have a look at that time when you might want to use a different color. And I'm talking about using an opposite color. So there are three sets of color opposites. You've got blue and orange, you've got red and green, and you've got yellow and violet. So those are your three sets of opposites, sometimes called complementary colors. And the idea of those is that if you put one into the other, you're then having a combination of the three primaries. For instance, if you add violet and yellow, Violet is made from red and blue, and yellow is your third primary. So what you're doing with those color opposites is you're always mixing the other primary colors in with the first color. It works whichever way around you do it. One will always have one primary color, and the other will always have two primary colors. Look at blue and orange, for example. Orange is red and yellow, and then you've got blue. So you've got your opposites going on there. And what will happen if you mix those opposites together is what happens when you mix three primary colors together is you get a neutral, you get a duller color. Just by mixing a tiny amount of it, what you'll do is you'll dull that original color. So let's just have a look here. Let me get a little bit of yellow here and let's place this down here like so. So this is a real light yellow. It would be pretty hard to get a shadow that was dark enough on that without going into a different color. You can see here I've got a little bit of violet mixed up on my palette here and let's just drop that in and you can see that you start to neutralize. I mean that's gone really quite dramatic, but you can see if we do it a little bit lighter here with a bit less paint, you can see that you can start to get those darks. And this works with any of your color opposites. Let's look at red, for example. So here I've got a little bit of red and let me quickly make some green. And here we can drop a little bit of green. I won't put too much in, otherwise you won't see the effect. So when we mix that into the red, can you see it just starts to darken and neutralize the color. So there you've got your first two options. Your first option is just to use a darker shade of the original color. Your second option is to use color opposites. And I'll try and remember to list the color opposites in the video description so that you have those to hand as well. Now, the third option is to use a new color. So why would you use an entirely new color? Well, the first time that you might use a new color is if you were painting, for example, on a white surface. So if you had a building, for example, with shadows being cast on it, then you might want to choose a color that was completely different. Obviously, you're not gonna paint white. So I've got some Payne's Gray here. And if I were painting on a white surface and I wanted shadows on a white background, this would be one of many options. Works really well on white backgrounds, this Payne's Gray. Another reason I might want to use a totally different color is if I'm painting something that has multiple colors within it. And then using that second color would really give me a lot of options and a lot more depth. Now, a good example of this would be something like bushes or trees where you might have multiple colors. So for instance, if I put some of this green in that I mixed earlier, and let's get this color from my new set. This is called Forest Shadow, and it's a much deeper, warmer, and more neutral green. And you can see here, I can dot that in. And it is a different color, so those shadows are a different color there. But when you've got a surface with multiple colors in, that's a good idea too. You can completely get away with doing that. In fact, it will enhance your painting and make it look more interesting, as though your shadows have depth and multiple colors within them. So those are your three choices, a darker version of the original color, a color opposite, or a new color. Now, so much for color, what about actual painting technique? Now, you get different types of shadow, and I'm going to talk about four of those options here. So you've got soft edge shadows, you've got hard edge shadows, you've got a combination of both, and then you've got sort of mottled or dappled shadows. So we're going to look at all four of those. I'm going to tell you when is the most appropriate time to be using each of them, and demonstrate exactly how they are done. So let's have a look at techniques for applying your shadows and we're going to be talking later on in the video about the order in which you apply them. But let's start first of all by looking at a soft edge shadow. So this is actually the safest type of shadow to do. It's the one that you'll pretty much always get away with and it's not too difficult to do. Now what you might have trouble with is blending and avoiding things like drying lines and hard edges and backgrounds. Now there isn't time in this video for me to go through techniques in too much detail, 
But what I'll do is I'll link to a video at the end of this one where I spoke previously about, um, and I spoke in depth about how to create soft edges and blended edges. So here we are, we're going in with our soft shadow. So I've pre-wet the paper. And of course, if it was paint underneath, I could still pre-wet. It doesn't have to be on white paper. And I'm going in with this color here. And this one is called Summer Clouds. And this is a color that I designed for cloud shadows on sunny days. And you can see it's a muted granular, sort of lilac leaning blue gray. And thereby applying it on a damp surface, I've got a soft edge. You can almost always get away with this kind of shadow. So what about hard edged shadows? So I've got another color I've made here called Storm Clouds. And this is a color that I designed for much stormier weather. It's almost in a similar color family but it's much stronger and deeper. So what we're going with here, and a bit grayer too, what we're going with here is we're gonna mix, and what I would normally do if I was working in a large area is I would mix a large puddle so that I have consistency of that shadow. And what you want to do then is you're gonna apply it strongly. You can apply it on something like a pathway. I've done a previous video about that or you can apply it on something like a white building. So it can go onto paint, but it can go onto white paper too. And you're just gonna go in very strongly and work on that dry area and put your shadows in wherever you see them. Now, the only time you really get shadows like this in nature is in conditions of very, very strong sunlight or possibly indoors if you've got something like spotlights on the objects. Now, this is much, much harder to pull off. It's quite necessary actually for um, subjects where there's a lot of sunshine showing, but it can be very hard to pull off. So if you are painting something like a still life and you know, you're sort of on a toss up. So shall I paint a soft edge shadow or a hard edge shadow? I would always, if you can, default to the soft edge because it is easier to get away with. And only go for this hard edge shadow when you've got these conditions of strong sunlight or strong light of some kind. And if you do this one, it's really important that you mix up enough paint to cover all of the areas within your painting and that you apply it on bone dry paper or bone dry paint. You work really, really quickly and you hit it and run. This is something that doesn't bear building up in you know, loads of little gradual layers. You don't want to be prodding at it, sort of layering a bit here, layering a bit there. It's easy to just make a big muddy mess. So if you're gonna do this one, have some confidence, throw it on a little bit stronger than you think it needs to be. If you look at it and think, oh, that's a bit much, probably by the time it's dried, it's just right. So let's look at another option, and that is the shadow that's hard edged on one side and soft edged on the other side. Now these shadows are very, very common. You get them on faces, for instance, you might have a shadow below the jawline. It's normally where there's an object or a fold or something is coming forwards, and then you've got the, uh, the shadow falling away from that. So it's often by an edge. So this is a shadow that you might have on a face. This is also a shadow that you might have under an object. Imagine a jam jar, you've got a hard edge next to the, uh, the jam jar itself where the shadow hits the object and then it fades out. You can probably see it a little bit on my fingers here, leaving the shadows on the desk. This is also the type of shadow shown on folds of fabric where the edge of a fold may be a hard edge and then you've got the softness as the fabric falls away. So it's really important to be able to do this one. So let's imagine a line. Let me draw a line here. So let's put a line here. Maybe it's a fold of fabric and I will be showing you how to paint fabric later on. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put my clean water on again, but you'll notice I'm only putting it on one side of the line and I'm not going right up to the line. That's because it's hard to see where you're painting when you're using water, it being fully transparent. So I'm stopping just close to the line, not going right up to the edge of it. So I've got a color here called Skin Shadow and this is something that I've designed to work as a blush or a shadow color on all skin tones because, and you're thinking, how is that possible? Because it can be fully adjusted. So it's somewhere between a red and a brown and it can be fully adjusted to go darker, lighter, cooler, warmer, more yellow, more pink. It can be adjusted to do pretty much anything. So I'm gonna put that here and you can see how I have a hard edge where I'm on dry paper. I'm getting some bleeding out there. That's because the, uh, the paint is too wet. So I'm gonna just dry my brush a little bit and just sweep that round. Now there is more than one way to do a blended edge. That is something that I teach, as I said, I've got a free video at the end of 
this video for you. It's also something that is taught in my Watercolour for Complete Beginners course. If you want to really, really practice this and really deep dive on these basic techniques like blended and graduated washes, I'll put a link to that in the video description. So here you've got a third shadow option and that is your hard edge on one side and your blended edge on the other side. This is a really important thing to learn in order to mold objects and get your shadows working effectively. Now there's a third type of shadow. So your third shadow type is a mottled or broken shadow. So this is something you would typically see on trees and particularly on things like tree trunks if you have you know, the sunlight shining through a canopy of leaves or something like that. So with this one, what we're going to do is I'll put some, just like I did here, I'm gonna put sort of an underneath wash on. And this is a color called Winter Bark. And this is somewhere between a brown and a black it's a color I've made to be really natural for really dark shadows on things like trees. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in with it fairly lightly here. Of course, it's great for things like pathways and it can be adjusted to make things like concrete as well. So let's put that there. What I'm going to do then is go in with stronger color and just sort of make a broken effect. Now, whether you keep this completely soft like it is here or you want to break it up and actually have a few harder edges in there because it can look really good if blotted. So here I've got some scrunched up paper towel so I could press if I want to. And I could also, if I wanted more unevenness to it, I could also add clean water or some other paint and just keep working in like that until I get that mottled effect. So we could have stopped at that beginning stage where I just had some darks in there, but equally, if we want to, we can just keep working into it. Some stronger bits in there too. And I can put that shadow wherever I see it and also get those broken edges. So there we've got our four shadow types. We've got soft edges, hard edges, we've got soft and hard together, and then we've got mottled or broken shadow. At this point in the video, if you're getting some value from it, can I please ask you for a favor? Could you please click the like button? Click that thumbs up for me. YouTube rewards audience interaction. So if you like, share, subscribe, or leave me a comment, it will help my channel and my videos be pushed out to more people. I'm just a few hundred subscribers away from hitting 50,000. I'm so grateful to all of you who watch me on YouTube. So we've looked at color and we've looked at technique. Now let's do some specific examples. The first one I have for you is fabric. And this is something that people often get wrong. And what I'm talking about specifically is when to actually place your shadow on. Do you place your shadow on before the actual body color of the fabric? Because of course towards colors are transparent, so that's an option. Do you place your shadow on afterwards? That's an option too, but sometimes things can run. So we're going to look at this in detail. And what I will say is that um, as I'm doing these small samples and these specific examples, do be aware of a couple of things. One is that I'm working much smaller than I would normally, just so you can see easily on camera. And the other is that the pencil lines will also be much harder than usual. And this again is just so that you can see on camera. I suggest that when you're doing your own under drawings, you keep the pencil much, much lighter. You need only as much as is necessary to inform you of where to put the paint. It's just that if I did it that way on camera, you simply wouldn't be able to see anything. So let's point the camera downwards again and have a look at when to place your shadows on fabric. So here I've done a little sample of the idea of some fabric draped across. So in my imagination, this is a blue fabric that has some green leaves on and perhaps some white daisies with yellow centers. So let's think about when you apply the shadows to this. Now, this can be a tricky thing to figure out and it's something that you have to play by ear. I can't tell you the other uh, rights and wrongs of it, but certain colors bleed more than other colors. For instance, red tends to bleed. Now, if I had put these leaves on or you know, green or even if they were something like red or purple, then I tried to paint shadow across the top. Although technically in terms of color, that would work okay because Watercolour is transparent, so it wouldn't matter which goes on first. There'd be a strong chance of those objects bleeding and running. The same with the yellow center. So what I'm going to do in this case is I've put the background color in, and now I'm going to put the shadows on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this in two stages. So we're going to do the shadows in this part of the video. And then once we've done the other samples and looked at some other things, I'll bring you back and show you how I complete this little piece of fabric. So do let me know in the comments. Actually, I do fancy doing a YouTube video featuring some fabric paintings. So let me know if that's something that interests you. So this is a prime example of somewhere where you would have both hard and soft edged shadows. So if you're wondering whereabouts to put the shadow on something like this, you always want to default to behind. So if this was a piece of cloth laying on a table, you would have shadow underneath it, assuming the light's coming from above. 
equally you could have shadow behind it but um, I'm not going to worry about putting the shadow underneath the cloth for this one because we're going to do that on a later technique but I want to show you how to put the shadow actually on the cloth itself so we've got several folds going on here haven't we we have to sort of think to ourselves what is behind what so let's have a look at here I've drawn a fold line can you see as well how I've actually adjusted the shape of the drawing so that it helps to show that fold line but that's something I'll cover perhaps in another video so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to lay some clean water on again this is something you have to be careful with because just clean water alone can leave a drying line so we're going to be a little bit careful with that and what I'll do then is I'll get some thicker paint just on the tip of my brush I'm using the summer clouds color here and I'm going to sweep that along. If it starts to bleed like that, it means you have too much water either on the paper or on the brush. So I'm just dabbing on some paper towel and just lifting some of that out. And you can mess around with this and blend that edge out. So that's not bad, is it? A little bit of a fold there. I've got a much bigger fold here. Now, it seems to me that that would be the reverse part. But if this is sort of going up in a big fold here, there might also be some shadow down here. So I'm going to drop a little bit of shadow down this area here as well. What I'll do too, to show you how it's done, is I'm also going to take it across the white area. Because the shadow's not going to avoid the flowers, it's going to sit across everything that is in its path. So let's put a bit of that in. I have gone off the edge of the water there, so what I'll do is I'll dry my brush off a bit, get some clean water on it and dry it, and then I'll sweep along the edge. As I said, there are two ways of doing soft edges like this. One where you soften as you paint on the water, and the other way you soften afterwards and I do have that other video at the end that will show you both of those techniques so that's not bad either then I'm going to go to this side here and again put some clean water here and probably coming down here as well and I want to get a little bit um, a bit stronger color this time so I'm going to take my paint along this edge what we're doing here is we're molding this piece of fabric with the wet and dry edges and I'm going to go in down here as well anywhere that's not looking quite right I'm just going to get my damp brush and just smooth that out don't want too much bleeding going on there and we're just naturally taking that shadow color over everything else again there's a little bit of the dip in the fabric here so you're always looking for things that are behind things or that are dipping down so there's a little bit of a dip here so I'm going to put some clean water here and I'm just going to get a little bit of shadow on that area up there too. Taking care always to leave those soft edges except where we have a fold line. And the fold line is a hard edge because it interrupts our view. And then finally I'm going to go over here. You also want to make sure that you're avoiding any previously painted areas. You want to do one at a time. Don't do anything that's touching anything else. Otherwise you're going to end up with um, bleeding and backgrounds where you don't want it. So again I'm going to go up here like this. I'm just taking that shadow colour really over anything that's in its pathway. Again, I've got some area here where it looks like it's dipping down slightly. So I'm gonna drop some shadow in there too. And we'll pop back at the end of the video so I can put the flower colors in and you can see how it looks. So now let's look at a still life object. And this is the perfect example of shadows where you need both a hard and a soft edge within the same shadow. So let's use that same technique to mold a still life object. Again, this would have some shadow on the table, but I'm gonna do that in the next example, so we won't worry about that now. I'm just looking here at molding the object itself. Now you can see I did put a second layer on the inside of the plant pot, so there's that too. So sometimes you have to work your shadows up almost in layers. What I'm going to do now is go in here. I, mean, I don't have this plant pot in front of me, I've just made it up, but I know from years of observation where the shadow will sit and I'm going to pop some in here just in front of this rim. Now this is not the colour that I painted the plant pot with but it's very similar. And this is my autumn foliage colour but as you can see it's great for plant pots too. So I'm just going to get that shadow going on in there. Now when it comes to the body of the pot I've got several things going on. I probably want some shadow down either side but there'll also be some shadow under the rim here. Again I'm going to default to keeping soft edge shadows because they're much easier to get away with. I did a little bit of blotting on this plant pot as well just to give it a little bit of texture. So let's go in there and let's get some colour just down the outside. If you have something that's circular, if you put a bit of shadow down each side, it instantly makes it look curved. I don't know if you ever did that thing at school in art, if they made you do that thing where you... Um, you, have, you make sort of a globe and you shade and you shade and you shade around the edges. Basically the bit that's closest towards you, which will be this part of the pot here because of the curve, it'll be closer towards you than anything else. That is the bit you want to keep light 
but we are just going to go dark here underneath the rim there. Now you can take some down the base here if you want to but considering I'll probably have some shadow on the table I'm going to keep that area fairly light and also leave it fairly mottled like that. Really happy with that effect. You can see that by adding the shadows we have made it look three-dimensional. So next I'm going to show you how to paint a soft edge shadow on a white surface and you would typically use this for things like botanicals, objects sat on surfaces but it can also be used to drop shadow behind something. For instance if you had some white roses you didn't necessarily want a background and they weren't sat on a surface but you just wanted a little bit of shadow behind the edge of the petal in order to make that flower show up against the background. This is a great technique for that too. Let me show you how it's done. So you can see I've painted an apple here and what I want to do is put some shadow underneath the base of it. Again I'm going to go for that soft edge because it's much easier to get away with and we'll put some water underneath like this and again I'm not going to take it too close to that pencil line but I am just going to take the water right up around here so that we get an area of sort of a circular type of shadow and I'm just going to get a little bit of my shadow color there. With this sort of subject and this sort of shadow it works best to go dark at the base of the object and then to fade the shadow out as it comes away. You do get other things going on particularly in the case of artificial lights as well you may get several shadows overlapping and you may even get if you're doing a real close observation sort of botanical style study you may even get some of the color of the apple reflected on the table as well but we're going to keep it simple here i'm just going to clean and dry my brush sort of semi-damp and just clean up that edge there like so you could make this shadow any shape that you want but i'm actually really happy with that result now it's fairly rare that you need a fully hard edge shadow, however it does happen and it particularly happens in bright sunshine, particularly at midday and it's often seen on harder objects like buildings and pathways so that's what we're going to look at next. So I've drawn the detail of the front of a house here and um, put a little bit of paint on it and we're looking at getting shadows particularly under the windows and under the drain pipes here and under these eaves. So what I've done is I've mixed up, this is some of my storm cloud colour so I've used some Payne's Grey in this picture, which is nice enough, but I think just for variation, I'm going to use the Storm Cloud now, which is a little bit more on the purple side. It's going to give it a little bit more interest. So if you remember what I said about hard edge shadows and sunlight, you need to mix up a good amount so that you're not faffing around and sort of, you know, putting it on light and putting it on a little bit darker and then all the edges go fluffy. You've got that paint ready to go. You also want to consider the direction the light's coming in. So I don't know with this because I just sort of made it up from glancing across the road at a house that's over the road. And you want to think about um, a direction for light. So for this one, I'm going to say that the light is coming from the top down and sort of coming in this direction. So it's going to go across like this. So that means that it'll go underneath things, not on top of them. And it means that also it'll be cast on the, uh, the right hand side of things as well. However, because you've got white here, you do actually want a little bit of, of shape to some of these things. So, you know, you're going to have to have some kind of little bit of a line and there would typically be a little bit of a delineation here between one item and another even if it's just sort of a, a crack where the wood is so I'm going to put a little bit of a line there and what I'm going to do then is be really brave and just sort of take a strong bit of colour in like so and just go up. It doesn't have to be perfectly straight it's much more important that you get it on quickly and you don't get a load of drying lines so we're going to avoid there being any puddles there just take that round like that. Also, I'm going to come along the bottom and go underneath these drain pipes and here as well. There would, of course, be some shadow on the roof here too, but um, I'm not going to worry about that for this video. But you'd probably put some of the darker brown on the top there. Now I'm going to use this same shadow colour to show up the windows. So again, we're looking at being on the right hand side of things. And that can even um, go as far as putting little bits of shadow, you know, perhaps within those window frames we assume they're not completely two-dimensional and then we'll get some shadow on the outside here and here and we'd get some shadow underneath as well and as I said you want to just make sure that you can actually see the edge of the window so we would just use just the tip of the brush to just get a hint of that if you're working in quite a loose style you don't even have to do that much because the eye will kind of understand what's going on there, you know, even if there is what they would call a lost edge there and you can't see everything. So we're just going to go underneath here as well and down here and we'll go on the sides here. We can also imagine there'd be perhaps some shadow underneath like this. And again, I will just get the hint of an edge around these other bits. And there you're starting to get a real feeling of sunlight. 
and what a beautiful colour because it's just got that hint of lilac in, just gives it a bit of brightness. Always on white surfaces like this, either a blue grey like your Payne's grey there, and you can see I use that inside the windows with a little bit of blotting, or your purple grey, it's going to look great. Warm colours don't usually work on white surfaces unless they are reflecting a warm object. For instance, if you had something like a walnut sat on a white surface, you might have a bit of warmth in the shadow. For white buildings like this, you want to keep your shadows cool on the blue or the purple side of the spectrum. So we looked earlier at dappled shadows, so let's have an example of how to do those now. And this goes for anything like trees, bushes, undergrowth, even things like beaches can have those dappled sort of spotted shadows. I'm going to show you how to do those next. So now let's look at that idea of mottled shadows and putting extra colours in. So I've got some sort of um, like a, a bush or a tree branch that I've done here. And what I'm going to do is just start working in loosely to paint this. So I've got some yellow here. It's already got a bit of phthalo in. So let's go in and start getting that on. And just dropping a few other colours in there. So when you're painting foliage, you always want to have the darker tones will end up in the centre and the lighter, yellower, sort of sunnier tones you want to end up on the outside. And that'll just give it a feeling that it's naturally being hit by sunlight. So we're going to keep it quite light to start with, just with a little bit of blue here and there. I'm now going to take my forest shadow colour. You don't have to use a ready-made green like this one. You can um, mix your own, for example. Or you could just work straight in with a dull blue, something like an ultramarine. And you can see here we get these beautiful strong shadows. And what I'm doing is I'm just allowing it to blend in. And although it's a different green, it's going to work simply because we have an idea already in our minds that there's a lot of different colours within every plant. So going in here, it's a beautiful strong colour, but it can also be watered down to be quite transparent. You can see how I'm keeping it in the centre and the base. I feel there's a few too many gaps here, so I'm just going to take a little bit of clean water and just blend some of those together. And you can see how I placed the tree branches in, first of all, so that we get them naturally showing through the tree itself. So what about flower and botanical subjects? These are the ones that people get wrong the most often, and it can be disastrous. It's not only important that you choose the correct color, because if you go into things like brown, it can really kill your flowers, but the technique is also very important. You need to have a delicate touch, but also to get some strong darks. This is going to help really mold your petals and your flowers and your botanical subjects. And we're going to look at two examples. We're going to look at a white petal and a yellow petal so that we can have a look at how these shadows work on different color flowers. So let's look at our white petal here and I've got a colour here that I designed for this sort of thing which is this petal shadow colour and it's been designed to go on top of any other um, colour that you might have botanically without making it look muddy or dead or without going green. Now there are sometimes green shadows and green hints on white flowers so that's another option. You could actually use some green to mould this petal if that's something that you see in the original photograph. If not, then there are a couple of options and this is option one. So what I'm going to do in this case is I'm actually going to um, wet the petal. I'm going to use two shadow colours within the same petal simply because I'm demonstrating I would um, choose one or the other. I wouldn't normally use both like this, but we're just going to pop that in so that we get a nice soft edge. And then I'm going to get a little bit of my petal shadow and just start working in. You want to be really delicate with white flowers and try not to add so much shadow that you end up losing all of the white, unless you've got those occasional petals that are completely in shadow. So got that colour there. You can actually go in tiny small areas, you can actually go quite dark. So I'm dipping in darker there, getting a little bit of strength there. So that's one option, that's your petal shadow colour. And just be aware that that colour is actually also in my um, floral set. There are only two paint colours in this new set that are in previous sets. The petal shadow is in my floral set because it's really important to have that in both sets. And then the Payne's Grey is also in my essential set. All of the other colours are new. But those two colours are colours that you will use a lot of. This is your other option for botanicals. This is Davies Grey. Davies Grey is a soft, slightly greenish grey. And again, this one can also be a good one for using on white flowers or even on yellow flowers where you see a little bit of a hint of green. I think it comes into its own mostly on white or green botanicals. 
because it's not quite as fresh and clean as the uh, as the petal shadow but it's still a beautiful color and it is included in this new set it is a color that's included um, in most manufacturers ranges so you may have it already however be aware that um, because it's a mixed color it will vary from manufacturer to manufacturer so there we've got those two options there so i'm going to move now onto this yellow petal and I'm going to go back to my petal shadow and the reason is that I don't want um, this yellow to go greenish and I don't want it to go brownish so the petal shadow color do you remember that I said that the opposite of yellow was violet this is why I've designed this color to lean onto the lilac violet side of the spectrum because that will avoid it going green when it hits yellow as I said there's nothing wrong with green being there if you see it in the flower but if you don't, if you don't see any green in that yellow flower and you want a little bit of shadow, then this petal shadow is, uh, is the one. And it's just going to give you that really natural hint of shadow without killing your flower. So I told you earlier that we'd be doing our fabric in two parts. So the shadows I've placed on are dry now. So we're going to go back to that one and finish it off. So the shadows on my fabric are drying out and it's time to complete the painting. Now you may have wondered why I went over the leaves with the blue and yet I didn't go over the other colours, I went round the flowers. So that's a matter of working out which colours contain uh, which other colours. Now for instance, I'm going to put green leaves on here. Now blue is part of green and the blue is very pale so the blue underneath is going to make very little difference to the green on top. However, if I'd taken blue across where the yellow is going to be, when I paint the yellow on, that's going to mix with the blue and make green. So it's all a matter of thinking about which colours go through which other colours and behind which other colours so that you can keep everything looking fresh. So the first thing I'm going to do is paint the centre of the flowers. And this is diarolite yellow from my essential set. And the essential set is a split primary set. Other manufacturers do them too. And they enable you to mix a large range of basic colours. So there's only two areas here where we can see the centre of the flower, so it's easy to pop those in. And for the rest of the details now, I'm going to use fresh green, and that's a colour from my floral painting set. But of course you could use any green here, you mix your own green. This is just an example of how it works, putting the shadows on and then painting across the top. So I'm just going to take that colour across very carefully. I'm not doing any variation in the colour because it is... Um, printed fabric so it wouldn't necessarily have variation in the colours and we're going to go around like this and you see that where I've painted shadow it just goes across the top of the other colours and because the watercolour is transparent the shadow will show up just as much painting before the green as it would if I was painting after the green because one just shows through the other it's a very subtle effect you can see The only thing that would remain to do would be to put some shadow below or behind the cloth or the background or um, whatever was in the image that you're working from. But you can see that putting the shadow in at the right time gives us a fantastic and three-dimensional effect. Do let me know in the comments if you found this video useful and if there were any particular subjects with shadows that you would like me to cover here on YouTube, let me know that as well. Now before you leave this video, do have a look in the video description. Not only will you find details of the paints that I've used today, but there are also some free downloadable PDFs that you can grab for no money whatsoever. Now if you enjoyed this video but you are still a little bit worried about your technique and your soft edges, I have a great video that I made for you a little while ago. It's going to teach you how to do perfect blending edges and you can watch that video right now.